So first on the list is Bob Quick. Is your item on the agenda? Yes. Okay, welcome. Hello, Mayor. I'm not Bob Quick. But... <laughs> My name is Bob Quick. I'm President and CEO of Commerce Lexington, and I'm here to talk about the comp plan. On behalf of Commerce Lexington, are more than 1,900 members, investors who employ more than 90,000 people in Fayette County, I would like to express our appreciation to the council for your work on the comprehensive plan. We've been a part of this process for over a year, hosting roundtables, attending meetings, and talking with many of you about our concerns. It has been a refreshing, it's been refreshing to be part of an inclusive process and to see how thoughtfully each of you have handled the critical decisions. We appreciate your, um, we, we appreciate you making uh, job creation and housing affordability a priority in this plan. We also appreciate the inclusion of a compromise expansion proposal to address short-term and long-term needs for our city's growth and development. We've studied this issue and delayed de decision-making on growth long enough. Our community is at a tipping point. Our workforce needs housing. Our employers need more land to expand. We're making it almost impossible for new businesses or young professionals to locate in Lexington. The changes you have made to the comprehensive plan are, are a significant step forward to addressing all these challenges. We just wanna thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your courage to do what is right, what the right thing is for the community. And we look forward to continuing to work with you as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, we are over our capacity in here. So if you are standing, I need to ask you please to go to the overflow and we will be sure and get to you if you're signed up. And one of the things that I'm going to do, and, and thank you very much for that. We don't want a, the fire marshal on us. <laughs> um, and then as I call your name to speak, I'll also call the next person's name so that you can queue up and be waiting so that we're a little bit more efficient with our time. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Dottie Bean, are you on the agenda? No, all right, all right. We'll get back to you. Uh, Jim Shropshire, where are you? You on the agenda? Yes. Welcome. If you'll state your name and your council district. Uh, my name is Jim Shropshire, and my wife Jane and I operate a 300-acre cattle farm, 3079 Royster Road. We're in cal council district 12. Um, as I've just mentioned, I'm a cattle farmer. I'm not an orator, so please be patient with me. Um, but I felt it was important to address you folks today on the issue of expansion. Um, I thought it would be helpful to you to put a face and a name with Fayette County Agriculture. And so I'm the poster boy, I guess. Um, our farm is in the area of I-64, I-75 split which means if you all decide to expand, we're at ground zero. We have the, we have the bullseye on our back. We're in that area. Um, I'm here today to ask you not to vote to expand the urban service boundary at this time. I'm asking that you wait for studies that will provide facts and data that will guide future expansion. Is expansion warranted now? Where's the data? And if so, where should this expansion occur? Question. And, who will, and what will the cost of this expansion be and who will pay for this expansion? I'm asking for a data-driven and orderly process. I participated in the last rush to expansion, expand in the 1990s. It was anything but orderly and data-driven. Many of us came away from that process disillusioned and frustrated. It created winners and losers. It divided this community. I would hope that we could do things differently today. There should not be winners and losers. That is not the way to move Lexington forward. Many of you on the council are concerned about affordable housing or the lack thereof. 
affordable housing was not built after the last expansion. Certainly, little of it was built in the expansion area. I don't believe it will be built this time unless it is required. And if you vote to expand first and then try to re require affordable housing, I don't believe that it will happen. Finally, if a decision is made at some point to expand, what requirements and rules will, you, will be put in place to safeguard farms such as ours? What protection will be put in place to enable us to continue farming and raising cattle? We have made a commitment to keep our farm in agriculture. What commitment in return is this community offering us and others? Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next is Brittany Rothmeyer. Is your issue on the agenda? And then if uh, Rhodes Cleland will please queue up. You'll be next after Brittany if your issue's on the agenda. Thank Welcome. you, Mayor. And there was someone that uh, yielded their time, so I just wanted to. Okay, now that I need to know who that is and where they are. Thank you, Robert James, 12th District. Okay, so time. okay, so you've yielded three minutes to Brittany, so you'll have six minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Brittany Rothmeyer, and I'm the Executive Director of Fate Alliance. You all have heard a lot from us, I know, but in light of the last cow and the historic nature of the decision related to the goals and objectives, I'm here again today to speak to you. Before the previous Cal vote, it came to our attention at Fate Alliance that our council members had received letters regarding the legality of expanding the urban services boundary and their authority to act on this from lawyers representing developers and home builders. We disagreed with the legal basis of those opinions and felt that it was necessary to hire legal counsel to outline and for us to understand the limits of council's authority to expand. Research and being a voice for our community are core to the Fate Alliance is as an organization. Please know that our intention is not and never will be to intimidate or threaten. We will, however, keep asking the hard questions and demanding and providing answers that are based on facts and within the law. Fate Alliance recognizes that Lexington needs more affordable housing, that people are being priced and displaced out of our neighborhoods. We believe in finding solutions to these issues. Some in our community, and we've seen some decision makers, say expansion of the USB is the solution to lowering housing prices based on the theory of supply and demand, and because that's what the community wants. We fundamentally disagree. But you don't have to take it from Fate Alliance. The Sustainable Growth Task Force, initiated by the mayor in the 2018 Comprehensive Plan, issued a report that was adopted by the council in 2021. It concluded that we have enough land to meet our market needs for the next 20 years. Civic Lex and the city led on the table in 2022 to get public input on growth. Fate Alliance and numerous community organizations committed financial resources and hours of time into a process that resulted in thousands of comments about growth. LFUCG created its own public input report within the planning department based upon research and hours of community meetings. Page 55 of that report reads that in general, people expressed a strong desire to see continued infill and redevelopment opportunities as the dominant way to accommodate future growth. The Bluegrass Realtors Association specifically hired the University of Kentucky to study this exact question. The answer was that expansion would not make housing prices go down in the long term. Expanding the urban services boundary up to 5,000 acres is five times the size of the Lexington Airport nearly. More than five decades worth of development at the rate that we're absorbing land, which can also be found in the Sustainable Growth Report and other studies. And yet, there's still no explanation of how we got to 5,000 acres or how exactly it's going to solve all of our problems. We're about to give away the store for nothing in return. No guarantees of anything no guarantees of types of housing or jobs, no guarantees of affordable housing, just like in 1996. Fate Alliance has consistently and continuously pointed to research to support our positions. We have not asked you all as decision makers to never expand the USB. We have not asked you all as decision makers to take our word for it. We've asked for a data-driven process to evaluate when, where, why, and how expansion would take place. And why wouldn't we want that for our community? We hope that you all will consider for the future success of all of us, putting completion of the goal four process into the goals and objectives before a mandate to expand the urban services boundary and let the process guide our next steps. 
Let's talk as a community about real solutions to affordable housing, preventing displacement, creating workforce housing and jobs, and creating a Lexington for everyone. Fate Alliance will continue to advocate, educate, and research whatever the outcome of the goals and objectives. We're committed to moving forward with our mission because we believe that Lexington is worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Rhodes Cleland. Is your issue on the agenda? Yes. Okay, and then if, is Bill Justice here? Bill, you'll be next up. Okie doke, welcome. Great, thank you. Thank you to everyone that's here, and council members and everybody in the room. My name is Rhodes Cleland, I'm District 5. I sincerely appreciate your dedication to the growth of Lexington. Thank you. From my point of view, I see this as an exciting time where this council has an opportunity to make an impact, to think next level, and write the future for smart growth in Lexington. Your votes will potentially contribute to the lasting legacy and desirability of Lexington. I am asking you to please consider what if we focus on process before expansion? To briefly share a bit of a personal story on what fuels my advocacy, as I was headed down here today, I was recalling my maternal great-grandfather. He owned a car dealership behind what is now Frank and Dino's. And then my paternal grandfather, he was an usher at the Kentucky Theater. And then he went on to work for the Herald Leader for over 30 years. My opinion is that they helped to contribute to the vibrancy of downtown. That was then. Now we need the opportunity to create the new future vibrancy. We need you to help create the opportunity. There are a few areas here, and I did send an email earlier this morning with links to substantiate the claims, but they are um, include research and studies to support some of what I mentioned. The 5,000 acres, that does uh, seem to be an arbitrary number. And what we learned from the 96 expansion is that adding land does not equate to more affordable housing. That was the big learning there. So what if we give Lexington long-lasting solutions to affordable housing? The next is choice. I ask to please find in your heart the capacity to choose a solid, methodical, albeit more difficult path versus an easy, fast, fleeting path. So I'm saying I support the completion of a data-driven process to guide growth decisions. Vision, I also want to mention that the sustainable vision delivered by Council Member Hannah Legree demonstrated strength and clear focus on what's best for Lexington based on data and facts. I believe that what we saw for um, needs to include infill and redevelopment based on research to focus on that solution. And you can choose a data-driven process to guide growth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Justice, and then is Karen Terrell here? Yes. Is your item on the agenda? All right, you'll follow Bill. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Justice, owner and operator of Justice Real Estate, established in 1980. In all transparency, I'm on the board of Fayette Alliance. I'm also on the board of the Kentucky Horse Park Foundation. I'm also on the board of Town Branch. I've served, proudly served the Bluegrass Realtors as their past president. And I want to thank each of you for what you're doing to make our community an even better place to live in. Kathy, we really appreciate you with all you're going through too. I probably have the best job in all of Kentucky. I get to show our city our countryside off to people from all over the world. These people not only buy horses, they buy farms, they buy houses, they buy office buildings, 
They invest in Lexington Live downtown. They stay in our hotels. They eat in our fine restaurants. And you know why? Because of our brand. The equine industry, Lexington, Kentucky, the horse capital of the world. That's why they're here and that's why they're investing here. This unique brand attracts the high-end jobs and the high-end businesses that Mr. Quick refers to. It allows us to attract and retain some of the best educators and doctors in the world. But it also attracts out-of-town developers, people from Birmingham, Nashville, California, who have no regard for what makes Lexington special. We all need to be vigilant, all of us, and cognizant of what makes and keeps Lexington the horse capital of the world. To that end, we need data and research, data supplied by competent planning staff, by our competent planning staff that us taxpayers pay for. They don't need to be mandated to expand willy-nilly, as Linda Blackford so well said. Lexington has a 65-year history of keeping a special planning model. You are responsible with keeping that tradition and with keeping Lexington, Kentucky, that special place. Our community, I got five minutes from Carolyn Conley. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you stand up back there and tell me who? Oh, thank you. Are you signed up here? Yes. Okie doke. All I don't right. go by too many buzzers anyway. But. We're, we have the, you know, the council okay. has its rules. Um, tell, tell me your last name again. I apologize. I don't have you on my list. Conley. Conley. Okay, thank you. Okay, three minutes. I don't need three more minutes. <laughs> Our community spoke against expanding the urban service boundary. Sewerability is a major issue. How and where we're going to pay for it. Exaction fees, how is it going to be paid for? Why are we, and I say we, why are we in such a hurry? Let's take our time and get it right. There's enough developable land in, in Lexington, Fayette County for 20 years. And I quote our mayor, thoughtful and deliberate planning is what makes Lexington such a desirable place to live. We need smart, sustainable, and equitable growth for Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Karen Terrell, and then is, oh, oh, I'm sorry, hang on one second. You know, we're relying on technology here. <laughs> um, is Phil Meyer here? Okay, Phil, you'll be right up next. All right, welcome. Hi, I'm Karen Terrell. I live in District 12, and I've been on some Zoom conference calls over the while with Smith Lohman, so thank you very much. And I got to meet you, the mayor, and some of you on the council this past, well, actually, just yesterday. I'm part of the senior intern program, and I really appreciated meeting you all, and it was just real timely because I did want to come to talk. I, I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, which is, it's now a high school, you know, no longer a farm. You know, that's a different story. I've lived in Lexington for 40 years, and I've, I've loved it. Uh, we built a house, uh, moved into it in 1987, which I know it was on a horse farm at one time. And I was sitting at a window writing a paper on a, I guess it was a word processor from IBM at the time, an old time, and looking out the window, and they were tearing down a fence across the road and putting another subdivision in. But I was living on something like that. I've promoted Lexington. I've recruited a jazzercise instructor from Huntington, West Virginia, to come to Lexington to teach. I love Thursday Night Live and Wood Songs at the Kentucky Theater and then moved to the Lyric. 
Southland Jamboree is wonderful. And now I can go to the senior center and learn a bunch of things. <laughs> so it's been wonderful. But we, I promote it. We, we've got to promote Lexington, but we, we need to do it carefully. Um, we want more people. I, I wanted more people to move here, but we have to have affordable places for them to live. I, I oppose expanding at this time. We need to make a better plan. In my work as a clinical laboratory scientist and then um, data entry, you have to have procedures and plans, and we need to be careful in what we're doing. So I want us to plan, 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 and now thank you for listening to me. I've got enough time to get out of here and go to my jazzercise class. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Phil Meyer, and then is Rob Tribbett here? Yes. Okay, you'll be up right after Phil. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. Um, I'm a lifetime, lifetime resident of Fayette County. I'm a retired cattle farmer. I now live on Shady Lane in the third district. I've been through years of these meetings and witnessed many expansions, big ones, and I have seen very little affordable housing created anywhere, which is a problem, as you all know. Uh, what affordable housing was created appears to me to be apartments with a 10 to 15 year reduced rent, and then after that they get refitted and the price goes way up and they're no longer affordable. So I ask you on the council, those of you that are voting for this, maybe because one of your reasons is we're going to get more affordable housing, what makes you think this is going to be any different? Because I don't think it is. Uh, there's been a lot more eloquent speakers up here than me today, so I'll cut my comments short, but I want to remind you for every new house that's built in the county and the property taxes that come in, for every dollar comes in, and you've heard this before, we pay out, we spend $1.67 on services. So building new houses is just going to put more strain on what we've got already. So instead we need to focus on finding ways to fund and create affordable housing, and we do not need this expansion. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Next is Rob Tribbett, and is Aaron Mikkel in the house? Michael, excuse me. You'll be up next. Welcome. Thank you very much. My name is Rob Tribbett, and I'm a resident of District 5 and a board member of the Kentucky Equine Education Project. First of all, I would like to offer my appreciation to everyone on the council and everyone that's been involved in the comp plan. I know it's a lot of work, and I appreciate all your efforts. However, despite these great in intentions, I do not think the vote by the council last week to call for expansion of the urban service boundary without relevant data and without a clear path for expansion does not resent, represent progress for the residents of our great city. The data that we do have is very clear. <clears throat> expansion of the urban service boundary will not accomplish the goals that we all desire. It will not, despite what the Commerce um, President would like you all to think, it will not increase job growth. It is not what our residents want. We have plenty of opportunity for infill and redevelopment that will help us have a more vibrant city while protecting our farmland that makes Lexington the horse capital of the world. Residents of our city have made it very clear what they would like to see. This proposed expansion made in haste out of a desire to do something rather than wait until we have a strong plan that benefits all in our city not just the developers that would like to see this land added to the urban service boundary. This is going to make our city more car centric, increase our infrastructure costs while building more homes that are out of reach of most of our residents. I'm urging the council to rethink their decision and to listen to the residents of our city who would like to see smart growth that makes Lexington the horse capital of the world that it's always been and continues to make it more affordable for more new residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Aaron. And Katie James, where are you? You're after Aaron. Welcome. Hello, council members. My name is Aaron Michael. I'm a resident of District 10, and I'm a relatively new Lexingtonian. So I'd like to share with you how I got here and some of my experiences. Um, when I graduated college, I moved to Los Angeles. I heard the weather was nice. I wanted a big city. First time I flew in, the lights and the sprawl as far as you could see, I was so impressed at the time, and that wore off. 
I realized when I moved there, I would never be able to buy a house. Rent was going to be a monthly struggle. Um, it was also the first time in my life I witnessed crushing poverty and housing insecurity by so many people. And I left after two years with less money than when I moved there. But then I moved to Louisville, Kentucky. I spent five years in Louisville. I started a family there, and we were lucky enough to buy a house. It was a great experience of my life. After five years, we witnessed the rising cost of housing, and the house that we bought increased in value, and we were still pushed out of the neighborhood that we grew to love. And from there, we were so fortunate to find work and move here. I tell you all of this because the previous cities that I've lived in before Lexington, they had an affordable housing shortage, and they had an increasing cost of housing, and neither of those cities had a growth plan. As it stands today, Los Angeles County is 500,000 units short of affordable housing, and only 2% of the county is farmland. Jefferson County is 58,000 units short of affordable housing, and only 7% of the land left in Jefferson County is farmland. Urban sprawl is not a solution to affordable housing. I've experienced that. 70% of the land in Fayette County is still farmland. That's incredible. And that is foresight by the early planners of this city. And I want you to know, I believe that we will have to use that farmland at some point to grow our city. It's inevitable. Not like this, though. Not without a plan. Not with how you're proposing. The way this city has thought about growth is more progressive than the larger cities that I've lived in. And I brag about that all the time. So what I'm asking you is to continue that progression to growing this city in a smart, sustainable, responsible way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Katie James, and then uh, is Casey Mather here? Casey Mather. Um, uh, that person has uh, yielded time to Richard Levine. Are you here, Richard? Okay, maybe somebody can see if they're out in the overflow. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank you. My name is Katie James. I'm a part of a seven-generation farm family here in Lexington, Fay County. I wanted to talk to you today about not expanding the urban service boundary. Um, 17,000. That's how many acres are available within the urban service boundary. Not 2,700, not 5,000 acres, like your current arbitrary request calls for. But 17,000 acres are available. Over three times the amount of what you're calling for. Lexington has sufficient vacant undeveloped and underutilized land available inside the current USB to accommodate Lexington's projected growth, including future job growth. That's 5,117 acres of vacant land, over 2,000 acres of which is zoned residential, and over 700 acres of which is zoned commercial. 1,112 vacant acres are currently in transition. We're calling for the completion of a data-driven and long-term strategy to evaluate Lexington's growth needs. And before receiving an updated sustainable growth report or updated sewer capability study, you all voted. Did you know what your constituents want? 8.1% of residents believe that private developers should not guide planning and development. 15.3% of residents support building new housing by expanding the USB, only 15%. Research shows that the residents of Lexington understand the need for a growth plan, but value one that is based on research and data. If you haven't heard of data-driven decision-making in your professional career, maybe the phrase, measure twice, cut once, will resonate with you. It's a reminder to take the time to double check measurements and ensure accuracy before taking any irreversible actions. Once you cut into the USB, that damage to our limited resources cannot be undone. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Now, I just need to see Casey. You're here, and I believe you have 
yielded your time to Richard Levine, is that correct? All right, welcome. You'll, if you'll state your name and your council district, and you'll have three minutes. Six, Six minutes, excuse me. Thank you, Mayor, city council members, fellow citizens. I came to Lexington as a young, if you can believe it, uh, professor of architecture at the University of Kentucky. When I came here, Lexington had less than half the number of people uh, that it has today. Uh, call that Lexington One. Lexington Two is the other half that we have now that, uh, and call that Lexington Two. People, Lexington Two happened because of Lexington One. Lexington was such a lovely place to live. Uh, it had a beautiful old center city with wonderful buildings, walkable neighborhoods, city services clustered all over, and uh, it was an attractor. It also had a wonderful landscape, a unique landscape of agriculture and horse farms, idyllic. Lexington II happened because of Lexington I. People were attracted to all of that. And the expansion happened in, in the surrounding areas uh, of the urban service area. Lexington was a pioneer, the first city in the country to combine uh, city and county, emulated all over, and even in some states which now have regulations for that kind of uh, city-county structure. What happened after that did not really follow that model to its, its best uh, development. It used to be, it still is, that we have people coming from all over the country. I recently hosted a family from Austria, which included one of Austria's preeminent film producers who stayed at my house. They put on a short um, film festival at the Kentucky Theater of three award-winning films. One of them was a film about China. It was about a research project that I participated in. I'm director of the Center for Sustainable Cities at at the university, and the, the CSC design, design Studio, Center for Center, Sustainable Cities Design Studio. I work all over the world giving lectures on sustainability. Uh, I recently went to China to work with my Chinese colleagues to produce a project for, for Brussels, Belgium, a sustainable neighborhood interrupted I hope temporarily by the pandemic. In China, they adopted a program. When I, got to, when I first got to Lexington, China was one of the poorest countries in the world. Today, it's one of the richest and challenging us in all sorts of ways. We're looking at the challenge as economic and military but they are actually making another challenge which may e be even more significant. China had adopted a program of growth at all costs. They ravaged their environment. They destroyed large parts of it. They, they did terrible things with their people. They threw people off the land and moved them into cities to work in factories to produce the China miracle. That, that gives us most of, the, most of the things that we use today and wear today. The, they, they did what, um, what Mark Zuckerberg much later called move fast and break a lot of things. They did that to their whole country. And now they've realized what an enormous mistake it was. So much so that they become the leaders in all kinds of 
sustainability and um, ecologically oriented uh, production and programs in the world. They make more photovoltaic collectors than the rest of the world combined, more windmills. Uh, they, um, and along with everything else, and they're exporting them to the West. This is the, this is the industry of the future. More batteries than anywhere else in the world. Not so many years ago, they started a program to build 185 eco-cities. These eco-cities, which they build in as little as six years, are each larger than Lexington. They're modern cities. They're far better than the horrible new cities that China used to build. I wrote a book on it. Here's the book. On the cover are two photographs of Tianjin Eco City. Tianjin. I'm so sorry. Your six minutes has ended. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I just make one last statement? Um, it isn't about affordable housing. No housing is affordable. It's about affordable, not affordable, but communities and rich neighborhoods, the kind that were in, in uh, Lexington One. Thank, thank you so much. We appreciate your comments. Sustainable communities will have, by definition, affordable houses. Thank you. Um, is Don Robinson in the house? Okay, Don, did you... Um, yield your time to Jim Hodge. Okay, Jim Hodge, you're up next, and then after you is Justin Landon. Are you here, Justin? Okay, you'll be up next. Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, uh, my wife, Mary Ann Delaney, and I live in the 12th district. Uh, I wanna speak on a, a narrow subject uh, as one uh, wiser than I said and has been quoted many times, oft expectation fails. Most oft where it most promises. If we expect that expansion of the urban service area will lead to affordable housing, we will be sorely disappointed. I want to introduce two articles into the record in accordance with your rules. I've given them to the clerk. The, uh, the first article was in New Republic, dated February of this year. It's entitled, More Building Won't Make Housing Affordable. As the title indicates, it explains in great detail from people who are very concerned about affordable housing, why more building won't make housing affordable. The second article that I have introduced and would like to discuss with you was in the Bipartisan Policy Center. Bipartisan Policy Center was formed a number of years ago by both Republican and Democratic senators in the United States Senate. This article was dated in August of last year and it's entitled 10 Actions Cities Can Take to Approve to improve housing affordability. By the way, none of the 10 actions in this article ex involve expanding an urban growth boundary. Just to briefly summarize for you the 10 points that these people make, and obviously they, they, they don't have a specific dog in this fight. First, legalize more apartment units. Second, legalize accessory dwelling units. Third, eliminate or reduce parking requirements. Fourth, more quickly and predictably approve developments that meet zoning laws. This section deals with doing development in the inner city and not out on the edge of the perimeter. Fifth, build more affordable housing near transit. And 
as many articles I've read point out, real housing costs aren't just the cost of the housing, they're the cost for the homeowner of the housing and the transportation of wherever it is they have to go to get to work, shop, and so forth. Six, establish and expand affordable housing trust funds. Seventh, improve housing voucher programs. Eight, maintain and establish emergency rental assistance programs. Nine, inventory and allocate public land for affordable housing, public land as opposed to private land. And 10, support community land trusts. In conclusion, they state, tackling the affordable housing crisis will require an all hands on deck approach at the federal, state, and local levels. Some of the actions highlighted in this block can be carried out at the state level, a more efficient process than instituting reforms by city by city. Nevertheless, cities should not hesitate to do everything in their power to address the urgent need for more affordable housing as soon as possible. No single policy is a silver bullet to sufficiently, afford, sufficiently improve affordability. So once again, this is an article by people who are concerned about affordable housing, but none of it and anything else I've read shows that you're going to create affordable housing by expanding urban growth boundaries like our urban service area boundary and putting housing out on the perimeter of a co community. You have to take all these factors into account, including where you put the, the housing and what we have before us, if it produces anything, it's going to produce, as it always has in Fayette County, market-based housing out on the perimeter of the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Is uh, Tony Brusate here? There you are. You'll be up next after Justin. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Justin Landon, District 12. I'm the CEO of Bluegrass Realtors, a trade association serving thousands of real estate professionals across central Kentucky. Um, I'm here today to say thank you for your work on the comprehensive plan goals and objectives. We believe that the goals and objectives as amended offer Fayette County residents a balanced approach to new housing and jobs and that which makes Lexington special. A housing shortage exists today and we need to start solving it today. The document you'll consider in the days ahead is a compromise of a lot of different perspectives. And as someone who spent 10 years in politics and 10 years running a trade association, uh, I hope you can appreciate that I can appreciate uh, how hard it is to stitch together all of those different perspectives. But I can tell you that the product that you're working on is better for having heard all those voices. Thank you for working through all the volumes of information that many of the folks in this room have presented to you as you've made an informed decision about what's best for our community. The truth is, despite the vote on these goals and objectives, there's still a lot of work to do. Many of the goals throughout the themes in the goals and objectives speak to ensuring that we're prioritizing housing that low and moderate income people can afford. Thank you. And I can't stress how important it is that we continue to emphasize those opportunities while understanding that we need housing of all types. Thank you again for all you do for Lexington and I would urge you to support the amended goals and objectives and ask the Planning Commission to have a plan by December 1st of 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up um, is Tony, but hang on just a second. Uh, John Tucker, are you here? He went in the other room. Yeah. What did you say? Yeah. Uh, Brittany, are you still here? I think John Tucker wanted to give you three more minutes. Do you need three more minutes? Okay. I just, when he comes back in, I'll find out if he wishes to speak. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Tony Brzezate. I am in the 10th District. Um, my wife and I have lived there for over 25 years now. Um, I come here feeling that I should have addressed this a lot earlier. I also serve as the president of the Central Kentucky Audubon Society. 
So I'm here in some ways to speak on behalf of the birds and on behalf of the habitat. And anytime there's expansion mentioned, it means loss of habitat. And I understand that that's going to have to happen at some point. But I also understand that a lot of people here have spoken against not using the data that we have at hand and rushing into this with the idea that it will provide affordable housing. Um, I spoke out against the Squires Road development and there was talk of compromise then as well. My district member at the time ran into me later and said how great it was that we got the realtors to compromise. But if you're talking compromise and they start high and you start where you think you should be and they pull you up, well, I sold cars in this town for 17 years. I understand how that works. That means that you haven't really won. Um, I grew up in Detroit as well, and I've seen people address problems with affordable housing by expanding the boundaries umpteen times. It takes two hours in good traffic to drive across Detroit these days. And when I was growing up, we were at 12 in Ryan, and then 17 in Garfield. My parents are now at 21 in Romeo Plank, and it's expanded beyond there, and it is still not an affordable city. It has left a husk downtown. I also come before you as somebody who lives on Rosemont Garden, where you talk about expanding the service boundary, and I can't get people to pick up my compost there. I don't have city pickup is come to a vote four times in the time that I've lived there. There are too many rentals down towards Nicholasville Road, and consequently, it gets voted down every single time. All I want is compost. I pick up my yard waste, I put it in bags that I buy myself because I don't get coupons, and I drive them around the corner so that I can leave them on other people's curbs because I don't want them to go to the landfill. If we just took our compost and sent it to the compost instead of to the landfill from our urban city area, which is already defined, would save a lot of money. Expanding will not necessarily bring you better housing, not without a really, really good plan. There are people here who said we need to fill in. There are people here who need to do better things. Cincinnati just bought hundreds of homes and offered them back to the people who are living there at subsidized loans. That's a way to do it. There are ways to do this smart, and then there are ways to do this where we lose a lot of birds. If you take care of the birds, you take care of most of the important things in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, John Tucker, uh, Brittany said that she does not need your minutes. Do you wish to speak? Okay. Um, then next up is Henry Jackson. And then after Henry Jackson is Kathy Adams. Where are you, Kathy? So you'll be next after Henry. A familiar face. <laughs> Hi, Mayor, members of council. <coughs> um, Henry Jackson, retired city planner, District 7. Uh, I agree with the Fayette Alliance analysis to not support expansion of the USB. Uh, I would urge adoption of the Fayette Alliance recommendations in their letter of April 18th. Additionally, I think LFUCG should first conduct a climate change vulnerability assessment and subsequently prepare a corresponding resilience plan, which is based on the risks that are identified in such a study. <coughs> Pardon me. There are two reasons for this additional step. First, uh, should our weather pattern continue, and specifically where it seems like most all of the extreme weather uh, continues to blow around central Kentucky, uh, we have a special opportunity to make the best of our fortunate location, especially in addressing a very likely and possibly immense influx of people in search of higher, safer ground. And also, by the way, in case of Lexington compared to other Appalachian refuges, uh, we're also something of a tourist destination, and we also have a world-class health care center, which are tremendous <coughs> draws. The second reason is that <clears throat> as the oldest urban growth boundary in the country, it seems fitting and logical that we make every effort to maintain the USB status as an urban planning landmark and example adaptation which I think would be especially useful in this likely rapidly approaching epoch of climate survival. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. 
Um, next is Kathy Adams, and Kathy will be followed by Ray Daniels. Are you here, Ray? Can, can someone, <clears throat> okay, thank you, Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Kathy Adams, and I've been in Lexington for the past 31 years. This is my first time at a council meeting and my first time giving public comment. I'm here today because I want to ensure that any decision to expand the urban service boundary balances both the needs of the entire community and the very thing that makes Lexington so unique and valuable, its protected farmland. I also feel strongly that a data-driven process is imperative to determine the trajectory of our land and our community. Some will argue that we need to expand because it will lead to more affordable housing and job development. That data does not exist or support the argument. You can read the report prepared by the Center for Business and Economic Research at the University of Kentucky Gatton College of Business and Economics. The report is dated March 24, 2017, and will explain that conclusion. And if you want to know how Lexingtonians feel about the, about the thought of expansion, look at the on-the-table on the data and the Imagine 2045 public input report. It reveals that most Lexingtonians in general expressed a strong desire to see continued infill and redevelopment opportunities as the dominant way to accommodate future growth. I love the city of Lexington, and I want to protect and safeguard what makes it so unique. Please take into account what the data reveals and what most Lexingtonians want. Please do not expand the urban service boundary without having a data-driven process that will inform how best to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Raymond Daniels, and is Judith Humble here? <coughs> Judith Humble? Okay, you'll be after Ray Daniels. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Persons. Uh, thank you for your service. My name is Raymond Daniels, District 7. Uh, and on behalf of Lexington for Everyone, I want to thank you for your hard work on the comprehensive plan, the work that you currently have done, the work that you currently will do. As you can see, we all kind of disagree on what kind of housing we may need, what kind of jobs need to be created, and that's really up to you, our Council Persons, to, to kind of figure, out, figure that out and create a roadmap for that. So. We, don't, we, do need, we do know we need housing, right? So I want to applaud you guys for your thoughtful and intentional approach for adopting a plan that reflects the needs of our diverse community. I want to thank you for prioritizing addressing housing affordability and job creation. Those needs while balancing the need to preserve and protect our unique agricultural land and equine community. Thank you for emphasizing housing affordability solutions, such as exploring opportunities for unused and underused city-owned land to be developed for affordable housing developments. Thank you for adopting a reasonable, responsible, parallel approach to addressing short-term and long-term needs to our city's growth and development. Thank you for recognizing the sense of urgency for immediate action in addressing our housing, all types of housing, and job needs. We've been studying the growth history for 27 years. In fact, the 2018 Comprehensive Plan called for the creation of data-driven growth management plan, but this, is not, this work has not been completed. We support completing that plan, but also taking limited action to address our community's most urgent needs, we have been, which have, we have identified through this process, through research, also as apparent in people's everyday lives. Less than 4% of the land within the current boundary is vacant and available for housing and jobs. Home prices have skyrocketed more than 80%. The city and school district is losing population. Land for job creation is limited to a handful of sites. Our community cannot afford to wait another five to 10 years for more study and growth process to be implemented. Development takes time and we are already behind. Our discussion over the last few months is proof that all voices are counted and heard and thank you for that. We look forward to continue to work with you and other community partners on housing, jobs and equity policy solutions. 
together we can make Lexington a place for everyone. And thank you again for your service. Thank you. Next is Judith Humble and is Marianne Fox in the room? Marianne? If someone wouldn't mind to see if she's in the overflow, please. Marianne Fox, welcome. Thank you. I'm Judith Humble. I'm chair of the Bluegrass Climate Action Team and I speak on their behalf today. We would like to go on record as strongly opposing the expansion of the urban services boundary. There are many reasons for this, but I will address two. The first is the issue of affordable housing, which many people have spoken to today. We very much understand the crisis. We support searching for innovative solutions. We have done extensive research on this subject, and the research we have done concludes consistently that expansion does not solve the problem of affordable housing. Indeed, it creates another one, that being the problem of transportation um, and car dependency for people who are already challenged to meet the cost of daily living. I've worked with a lot of these people in my career, and I've learned over and over again that maintaining a working vehicle is one of the biggest challenges they face. So we support the search for other solutions, and we believe that they are out there. The second thing I want to do is put climate change on the table. I think a major development in our comp plan is the addition of the language describing climate change. We now have a goal to reach net zero emissions by 2050. I'm very proud of that. And we've started some important work in this community. We know that outward growth will inevitably make a dramatic increase in our emissions at a time when we need to be moving in the other direction. It's time we started work on maintaining a livable climate. And for anybody who's in doubt about climate change, we've had four signature events in recent times that provide evidence it's reached Kentucky, that being the Eastern Kentucky flooding. They're still working on recovery down there. They'll be working on it for a very long time. And the news says they may not be able to afford their new increased insurance premiums. We've also had uh, the recent polar plunge which damaged plants throughout the area. We've had the severe storm that damaged tree canopy throughout the area. And a little bit further back, we had the severe tornadoes in Western Kentucky, which took out a major research station. So we believe that we've started good work in Lexington on this problem. We'd like to see Lexington continue. And then we think expansion of the urban services boundary is a move in the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Marianne Fox is next, and then uh, Don Todd, you will follow Marianne Fox. You'll be up next. Welcome. My name is Marianne Fox. I live on Holly Springs Drive in the 11th District. I'm not in favor of expanding the urban service boundary. I came to this decision after learning from a city planner that Lexington already has enough available land within the current boundary to meet our housing and job creation needs for the next 20 years. I believe this move to expand the boundary is premature and will only eat up the unique farmland that currently draws business and tourism dollars to our city. It won't lead to more affordable housing because increasing the size of a city doesn't decrease housing prices. It simply puts money in the pockets of developers and increases sprawl in traffic, a decrease in quality of life and making Lexington less attractive to investment and outside talent. There's a smarter way to grow our city, one that uses infill and simple changes that make the most of the land we already have and that isn't being used to its fullest potential. But if council does expand the boundary, surely it shouldn't be done without a plan one that is based on data and evidence and not on assumptions. Please don't just redraw the map and let the chips fall where they may. Lexington deserves better than that. We need a data-driven plan in place. And finally, I urge you to require the groups who are lobbying you for expansion to disclose their funding sources. If they won't voluntarily disclose where their money is coming from, that means the information is a secret. Secret money is not good for our city. It leads to undue influence and it disenfranchises voters who can't afford to secretly fund their own lobbyists. Please put a stop to the secret money situation before making any decisions about expansion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Don Todd and then 
Liz Natter, are you? Okay, you'll, you'll follow him. Thank you. Three minutes is not a long time there. That's right. You better use it quickly. <laughs> oh, Welcome. Well, give me a little more time. <laughs> Don Todd, 12th District. I, I've had, I've served on three comprehensive planned update committees and I served eight years on the city council. I've been involved in this process since 1978. I've seen it, been argued, been through it all. It, nothing changes. It's the same issue. Should you expand the urban service area or not? And the answer to that question is maybe. It depends. What does the data show? You cannot make an arbitrary decision of 5,000 acres and then turn around and say, oh, gee, we don't know why we came up with that figure. How do we justify it? It'll never stand up in a court of law. It never will. But that's not what we're here about. We're here about trying to educate you. So I've given you, uh, you know, 11 points there that I want you to consider when you review this issue. These are pretty significant points. I don't have the time to go through it. So I want to talk to you about the horse farms briefly. We have done a terrible job at educating you about the importance of that industry and how it interrelates with this community. Terrible job. And that's our fault, okay? We used to take the council members out to all the farms. We'd show them the stallions. We'd show the breeding operations. We'd show the pastures. We'd show where the mares are. We'd show them all the aspects of how the farm works. What's the most important thing for the horse farms? Why are they here? Anybody on the council know why? Why are the horse farms here? The stallions. The only reason why they're here is because of the stallions. If you take the stallions out of here, we lose everything. And so why are the stallions here? Best veterinarians, best soil people, best farm handlers, best feed managers, got the university to support them. We have bloodstock agents. We have uh, people that are involved in every aspect of the industry. We have hospitals, emergency care centers, all related to this industry. What's the worst thing you can do to a horse farm? Anybody have any ideas? Put a subdivision next to it. Kids and horses do not mix. Kids and dogs do not mix. You cannot do that. If you're gonna put something next to a horse farm, you put light industry, or you put P1. You do not put residential, period, or you ruin that farm. Because if I'm a farm manager, and I've got brood mares worth $200,000, or in full, or whatever, and I've got a subdivision next door, I've gotta build an eight foot high fence, bury it four inches, six inches in the ground, and then I can't use those pastures. I'll turn out barren mares, I'll turn out teasers, but I won't put my good animals in that field. None of you knew any of that. It's important for us to teach you. We did a piss poor job. Thank you very much. Can I have another one minute? I'm sorry, I am having to uh, make the rules work for everybody All right. equally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, you have a friend. Amy Clark is giving one. up. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Amy Clark, can you wait right there, please? Has said she'll give you one of her three minutes. I, I might take it. I'll be, that, I'll be quick. Is that, and she is signed up. Okay. You want to give him your three minutes? All right. Thank you. You have three more minutes. So we don't say give us 5,000 acres and, oh, well, let's go out Winchester Road and along I-75 because there's no horse farms out there. If you want to build a horse farm, you don't buy an old horse farm. You buy a cattle farm. Why? I don't know. Parasites, no other animals been on that farm for a long time. You want a clean farm, you can start over with. Yeah, you have to develop it. You have to build fences. You have to do things. But a cattle farm is the best farm for horses. So Winchester Road is a particular, a particular nice area. It's got good soil. What do we know about soil? Why would we go out Winchester Road? Does it have Maury silt loam? Does it have Huntington silt loam? What kind of dirt does it have? Hell, I don't know. Well, that's why you look at your soil maps and you make those critical evaluations. That's what we do in the PDR program. We make all those evaluations. We just don't buy what the developers sell you. I got up two minutes. When I was on the council, developers always came to you, same story. 
Don, you're doing a good job. You're going to go places in politics. We really like you. But let's give you a little money, help you win. We need this expansion. We got jobs out here. We got all this. Well, if you go back and look at the points that I gave you, how much affordable housing have we built? How much land is still available? We put 2,500 acres or 5,000 and 90, whenever it was, 98. We put that in the USA. We use 110 acres a year. That's what we develop, 110 acres a year. So what's this big land rush all of a sudden? Well, it's because a lot of guys have got options on that land now. There's some speculation going out there. If you don't believe me, go down to the clerk's office, like I did, and look up in the, in the deed books, grantor grantee indexes, and look and see what options have been acquired and where they are and whose name are they in. You guys don't know all that yet. A lot of you are green. That's okay. You're going to have to learn. You're going to make mistakes on the way, but be patient. Take your time. Listen to these, these folks over here and know what they're doing. And serve us right, because you represent one chain, one link, you know, in the higher chain of Fayette County and the industries that it's had and, uh, you know, the way, the lifestyle that we have. It's really important. Um, that's about all I have. I just wish we did a better job at educating you. When I was on council, we'd put you all on buses uh, and took you to every horse farm. And then we opened up the buses and took the people that wanted to go. And then we took you to all the various aspects of the industry so that people could see how it interrelates and how many people work in the industry and what jobs are created and how you have people in the entry level all the way up to veterinarians and you know people that are, that are highly educated. And that's a really sensitive industry. It's very fragile. So you have to be very careful about what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Liz Natter and is Ann Bacus in the house? You will, you will follow Liz. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Liz Natter. I'm in District 10 and um, I don't have any prepared remarks, but I wanted to uh, just stand up. I wanted to thank each and every one of the council members for your commitment to public service and for your commitment to public comment. I know sitting through meetings like this is, uh, is, can be a chore, I'll say that. Um, I, um, I do feel that uh, affordable housing is extremely important to our community and, and we really need it and, and we see it that all the time. Uh, I don't think, I agree with many of the speakers here today that I don't think expanding the urban services boundary by 5,000 acres without putting in a process that guarantees that there will be affordable housing makes sense in terms of that goal. I, I also agree with what many of the other speakers here have said about um, planning for climate resilience, the kind of smart planning that our, that our planning staff uh, can do and needing a data-driven process. So I'm not gonna use all of my time. Thank you all very much for uh, allowing me to speak and for uh, listening to all these comments. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Ann Bacus is our final speaker. We have no one else signed in, so welcome. Thank you. I'm District 10. Okay. The Sustainable Gro Growth Task Force and Advisory Committee was created by our mayor and $125,000 was approved by our city and Stantec was hired to help us. We had 19 members on our committee and we met 16 times between the year of 2019 and 21. I was co-chair along with Greg Padgett, Randall Vaughn, Steve Kay, our vice mayor, Dennis Anderson, Amanda Bledsoe, Price Bell, Larry Forrester, Richard Gaines, Chris Nahn, Frank Penn, Don Robinson, Lynn Phillips, Fred Combs was advisory, Greg but Butler was advisory, Lewis Johnson was advisory, David O'Neill, advisory, Becca Self, and Myron Thompson were all advisory me members. We worked hard. We worked truly hard for that time. I ask for you all to please consider requesting our planning commission to share their data-driven information with you that our committee created the baseline for and they update yearly on available land. Please show that you are interested in the work 
that we put in place to make these important decisions. Let our planning commission do their job and complete this work that we started that you can make this important decision on baseline data. We need good data to make this decision. Please don't put the cart before the horse and request that our commission completes this process before they affect our urban service boundary. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no one else signed up for issues on the agenda, so we will go to our docket. And I, by the way, I do appreciate everyone who showed up today to speak as well as to listen. Uh, we have two dockets, so we will start with the June 13th, 5 o'clock docket for today. I make the motion to amend the motion to add the following to theme E, goal three, objective C. Um, I can read it all out. Um, by December 1, 2024, adopt a new expansion area master plan to ensure the above acreage is responsibly developed while balancing the integrity of our agricultural land and the clear need for additional acreage and to address Lexington's housing and economic development requirements to ensure coordinated development. The master plan should plan for infrastructure, community facilities, and land uses that include a variety of housing types which focus on low and middle income housing types and a wide array of employment opportunities. It is the intention of the Urban Urban's Council, County Council, that the new expansion area master plan include provisions for construction, creation, and or funding of additional affordable housing units as defined by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development and Middle Income Housing. As such, the Planning Commission shall recommend to the Urban County Council mechanisms to create, construct, and or fund affordable housing um, units and middle income housing in correlation to the development provided for in the expansion area master plan. Completion of this master plan shall be the priority of the work of the Division of Planning to ensure timely adoption and implementation of critical needs identified. So Thank moved. You. Council Member Ellinger seconds. Now, we'll need to have discussion on this amendment. Is there anyone who wishes to discuss? Councilmember Plowman, were you on for a separate item? Do you mind to come off? And then will anybody who wants to uh, discuss the amendment can log in, please. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Ellinger. Thank you, Mayor. And I'd ask the... Um, uh, Planning Department. Um, Director Duncan is Director here. Director Duncan, yeah. We are having a sidebar there. And Welcome. One of, one of the issues that we're talking about with this expansion is going to be affordable housing and if it's going to create affordable housing. And we actually, I think, in the 96 expansion, if you look at what Don Todd put in there, what he gave us in his points, it said a specific incentive plan program for affordable housing was created during the last expansion was not utilized by any developers. I guess was that a and not a mandatory um, requirement, but it was a volunteer one. And in one of the terms that we talked about last time, what I brought up was inclusionary zoning. And would this be similar to that, that, there were, that the, you all would come up with a plan that would require uh, affordable housing and we wouldn't set a percentage on it, but you all would set up a system that would, would require that then? So, Councilmember Ellinger, to answer the first part of the question, the, the uh, options in the expansionary master plan in 1996 were voluntary. So, if uh, a private developer provided uh, housing that met the affordable standard, which would have been uh, the HUD standard, then they would have been given a density bonus uh, in order to offset that uh, so that they could build additional market rate housing to offset the cost. Uh, of, of having to set aside land and, and make the affordable housing available. It was a voluntary program. 
and uh, it was not it was not taken advantage of by any of the developers. So that was the first part, and yes. then the second part on this does does this um, amendment does this take require then does this become a mandatory um, part that when you all set up the master plan that will require then affordable housing and will you look at the AMI is it 80 percent 50 percent how 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 is what how do you foresee this working I believe this objective is stronger and if it says it it is the intention of the council that the that it include affordable housing then I believe that would be the expectation of council that when the master plan was returned or when the master plan was adopted by the planning commission that there would be provisions for the affordable housing which essentially means the planning, the, the planning Commission would be recommending back to the Council what those mechanisms are, whether that's an inclusionary zoning ordinance, whether it's a funding mechanism to ensure that there's a robust funding source to be provided to other, uh, others, or other changes that would be needed, be needed to ensure. But the master plan will be making those recommendations back to the decision makers, the Urban County Council. And then, and then just because we do expand does not mean that it, it, it automatically that they're going to be due to, to new developments. They still have to go through a zone change and they'll still have to come through with our goals and objectives that will require this then, correct? Yes, and a, and a development plan as well, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilmember James Brown. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Councilmember, for bringing this ordinance forward. I know it's been a Affordable housing has been a topic and a, uh, a point of clarity that a lot of council members wanted to make in regards to the comp plan. And director, if you don't mind coming back to the microphone, I just have a few questions. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think from the, com the conversation that we had uh, last week, was that last week or was that two weeks ago? Seems like a long two time ago. ago. <laughs> um, Councilmember Legree's motion, we, we kind of had this conversation and got to the point to where uh, putting all this back in the hands of the Planning Commission, we wanted to give them the, the, the maximum amount of flexibility to do what needs to be done at their level. Put, changing this language or, or inserting this language, uh, it feels like to me that we may be, well, let me start by saying I'm a full supporter of affordable housing uh, and that we need to do it. But I just wonder if putting this language in there makes it too confining for the Planning Commission to do what they need to do in regards to developing an expansion area master plan. Uh, and then the other layer, and I, I guess I just said that as a statement, the other layer seems to me as if, you know, I think we were being advised that Council's role is to set the guardrails for the, through the goals and objectives. So if we put this in here, then it has to come back to council to be approved for the affordable housing mechanism that gets put into the expansion area master plan. Is that correct? No, sir. What the, the master plan will be recommending solutions. And so those would likely be amendments to the zoning ordinance, the ZOTA process. Uh, they might be recommending funding mechanisms that would not have anything to do with zoning, but that the government would, would, would identify a funding stream that then make that available through the for affordable housing fund and any any other number of recommendations that would ensure an afford uh, an increase in affordable housing <laughs> supply so no so those just the the list of recommendations do not have to come back to you for approval but you would then decide if you wanted to turn those into policy okay so are there any policies and just if you can give me an example of any any policies or any mechanisms that the Planning Commission and staff can put in place in an expansion area master plan to encourage or or as close as you can mandate that affordable housing be built? Is there is there anything you can do in regards to the zoning, to the density requirements, or anything that that would give? Are there any tools that would encourage and compel affordable housing be built? There are tools that could could help enable it, Councilmember Brown, but they wouldn't. They could not require it, uh, and and we continue to to pursue those tools. You all have already addressed a number of those by uh, big and small through through the floor area ratio, through eliminating the parking requirements, through the accessory dwelling units. So those are the kinds of, of tools, but then there are additional tools that ensure that there are. Uh, density, perhaps density minimums, and certainly no density maximums. 
uh, other, other dimensional tools such as how, how small a lot can be and be, still be considered a single family lot. So those kind of things can, can be put in place in the zoning ordinance uh, and our subdivision regulations that certainly offer more options for affordability. And perhaps a nonprofit who would be doing affordable housing with funding through the government or other sources uh, could take advantage of those, perhaps even more so than a private uh, for-profit builder would. Okay. And I, and I appreciate you sharing that because that's what I was thinking. I think, I think we were headed in the right, or are headed in the right direction in a lot of ways to eliminating barriers to create affordable housing. Um, you know, without saying it, but I guess Council Member Ellinger already said it, is that this language is going to push the inclusionary zoning button. And I have concerns that that's going to, I'm, I have concerns that that's going to trigger a reaction at the state level. Is that a real concern uh, from your experience talking about inclusionary zoning, or is that not a real uh, concern? Yeah, it, it is a, it is, it was a, it was a reaction. In the 2007 comprehensive plan, when we listed a number of affordable housing options that other communities have used successfully and said that the Lexington could look at these and consider these without a recommendation that they be further pursued, then uh, uh, amongst the Fayette County contingency in the legislature, there was an effort to, to uh, prohibit cities from doing that. Again, this, but, but what would be coming to you would be a list of recommendations and it would be up to the council to decide whether they wanted to pursue those. And having the discussion, and of course that was, you know, 15 or so years ago, so perhaps things have changed, there would be a different, uh, different approach to that. I don't think saying the words out loud, we should be afraid of that, but there would also be other considerations that the, that the council could, could look at. Okay. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Gray. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to make note on why I'm bringing forth this amendment. Um, because we, it is already inferred in what we've already done, affordable housing. Um, however, um, I'm hoping by saying explicitly affordable housing that we don't repeat what has happened previously in Lexington's history. Um, I believe by expressly stating affordable housing, that puts it on record that we're giving planning the abilities to decide the mechanism and so that they have it always in their purview, that we are seeking to ensure that Lexington is a place for all citizens um, and that we're thinking about affordable housing according to the HUD uh, recommendations and according in our middle class housing, which often gets left outside of the conversation. I know that many people would like to keep Lexington as it is, but as it is, it's becoming a city that no longer, that many people who have been born and raised in Lexington can still live here. It's no longer became a, uh, a city where our po own police officers and our firefighters and our educators can make Lexington their home. And I wanna make sure we do all we can to protect those people who are not here, who cannot come to these meetings because they're working and they want to make sure that they live here for a long time. And I wanna make sure our next generation no longer has to deal with what, we're, what I am dealing with and what so many other people are dealing with. I know that this is not something that most people in this room can relate to, but we have a lot of people who are struggling and I'm speaking on behalf of them with this, this amendment and I'm hoping that my colleagues will stand with me and say, Yes, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Wu. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of the things I feel like that's come up over and over again in this entire debate from both sides of this issue is everybody talks about affordable housing. And so we've also heard arguments of uh, the, the idea and the fact that we haven't built a lot of affordable housing uh, in previous expansions or in expansion areas. We've heard about how mandating a percentage uh, may not work, may not be, you know, legally defensible, um, various other arguments. And for me, it always comes down to if you don't try, you're not going to get there. And, and that's really it. So I think having um, philosophical language in, um, in some of the goals and objectives and aspirational language, I think that's important. But I think putting in more solid, concrete frameworks 
for um, building the mechanisms to create more affordable housing, I think is very necessary. So if this is indeed a point on which all sides agree, I think it is important to move forward uh, in this manner. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. I'm going to call on press council member Worley first since he hasn't spoken and then we'll go back to council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, council member Gray for this additional language. For those that were listening to our conversation on June the 1st, this was a, a, a lot of discussion about what does this expansion area master plan mean and what's its purpose. And so many people say, oh, we're just expanding without a plan. Very specifically, we are asking the Planning Commission to make a plan to say where acreage ought to be expanded, what it should look like, how it, and what are those policies that should be recommended to encourage the type of development that we want. And we've already made a very strong statement in Councilmember Legree's edition last thir uh, Thursday to state that we want policies and procedures and planning for low and middle income housing. I think making it even more specific, more called out in this particular uh, instance, it shows that this, this theme E is a statement of intent by this council. And it's asking that we continue to work towards policies. And this is amazing to me the way this discussion has happened over this past weekend, whether it be an editorial in the newspaper or uh, the work of, of, of some of the lobbying groups, but I've never seen the word affordable weaponized before in my life. When we make a statement that say we want to do something to make housing more affordable, and then now we all have to debate about whether whether that word means what it means or what it, what it actually means. And it somehow is bad that we've said that our justification for expansion is affordable housing. Folks, that's not, that's not real. And we cannot, it's true, we cannot guarantee that every unit or any unit in the expansion area is affordable unless we make statements that say we want to try, we want to do something because right now what we're doing, nothing is making the entire county unaffordable. And again, we hear, we hear more data, more data, more time. 80% increase in housing costs in 10 years. Lexington had the seventh highest rent increase in the country last year. We're losing jobs, we're losing citizens. And so we can't criticize policymakers for aspirationally saying we want to build affordable housing or we want to try to do something that will make housing affordable. So, Council Member, I thank you for this because I think it makes it clear what our point is here today. It's again asking our planning commission, which we have been advised through many, many conversations, many debates, many compromises, for us not to make all these decisions, for us to ask the planning commission, our planning staff, one of the best in the country, to talk with stakeholders, to talk with residents, and come back with those policies to us. So I think we'll probably be talking a lot more tonight about this issue. Will we have affordable housing? Does this expansion guarantee what we want? It may not, but we're trying and we're making statements of how we're going to, and if we do nothing, we will get nothing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member James Brown. Thank you, Mayor. And Director Duncan, just, just one more question. I, I asked about this language and how it could potentially uh, uh, confine the planning, the planning commission. Are there any recommendations that you think may come out that may prohibit development or us or, or the commission being able to zone certain properties appropriately because of their relationship to agricultural operations uh, just to make sure that we include uh, the residential uh, requirements or, or the need for residential units that we're talking about? Councilmember Brown, I, I may not be fully understanding your question, but I, I believe in the, I, I would expect in the development of the master plan uh, that, that we would not only be looking at, of course, the where of expansion and, and the relationship of that land to the ability to provide infrastructure, particularly sanitary sewer and, 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 uh, and roads, but then also what would be its impact on, uh, on, on the, the rural resources that we're trying to protect. So that would be part of that uh, equation. Uh, as well as these recommendations that would be coming out of that master plan. That there, so there's a kind of a map and then there's the, the policies that would be coming out of that, the recommend, recommend policies that would then be addressing uh, this request for affordable housing solutions. But then there would be other mechanisms as well, uh, like 
uh, buffering and, and that sort of thing that, that, would, that would need to be put in place to ensure that the rural resources that we're trying to protect uh, have adequate protection as well. And, and, I, and I apologize. I guess my question was kind of hard to answer and, and, and understand because I think it was hypothetical. But I think the basis of it is I think we all want to make sure that if land gets identified and is zoned properly, it gets developed. And I just want to make sure we're not putting language that would make that hard to accomplish once we move forward. I, I don't see this as, as doing that, Councilmember Brown. Okay, thank you. And then um, is it Tracy? Who's here from law that could speak to this language? Welcome. Yeah. Tracy, and I guess just following in the same spirit of uh, two weeks ago, are you all, I know you wrote the language, but are you all comfortable and is, are, are you all comfortable with the language and have any, have any concerns? We're, we're comfortable with the language. I think it allows for it to go back through the expansion master plan process and be, you know, come back with recommendations from the planning commission to you all if there's specific items that require your all's action. All right, thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Are there any other council members who wish to speak to the amendment? All right. All those in favor of supporting the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? No. All right, there's one no vote. Um, council member Fred Brown. That motion passes. Now, we are still on the uh, goals and objectives, and I believe, uh, Councilmember Plowman, you were signed up for something different, presumably. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> you hear me? Okay, thank you, Mayor. I have a short little preamble I'd like to give before I actually bring my amendment forward, Mayor. Um, as you're aware, I was unable to attend and ultimately vote at the June 1st Council of the Whole last week due to an unavoidable health-related issue. That was the meeting where the verbiage and the decision was made to proceed with the proposed goals and objectives forward with the first and second reading both tonight and on Thursday night. Were I in attendance, my vote would have been no against expansion without a plan, a fact-driven plan. Um, as a matter of fact, with so many folks that spoke tonight, not just from the 12th district, but from our community, I am against the expansion of our urban service boundary without a bona fide plan. However, I will bring to you today that less than 48 hours, we are mandated by the state to submit our goals and objectives, less than 48 hours. And I will also bring to you that we do not have eight votes to overturn the expansion of 5,000 acres. So what I would like to bring to you at this time is a consideration for reduced acreage that would soften the impact of unnecessary, unprecedented, and unsubstantiated 5,000 acres that we have before us. It is important to note that 27 years ago, in 19, 96 that we still have approximately half of that 2700 acres that are still undeveloped if you were to take the 5000 acres that we're considering add on to that the 2700 that are just sitting there un undeveloped that's close to 8000 acres that's not going to happen that absorption is not going to happen in our lifetime so why are we considering that so what i would bring forward is an amendment and this amendment would go forward to Let's see here. This would go to the theme E, and this would be goal three. My amendment would to, to identify 2,700 acres for inclusion within the urban service area, thereby deleting no less than 27 acres, 2,700 acres, but no more than 5,000. So that amendment again would be to identify 2,700 acres for inclusion within the urban service area. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Savigny seconds. So we have the amendment for up for discussion. If you have a comment, council members, please log in. Councilmember Ellinger. Thank you, Mayor. 
could you restate, did you say up to 2,700 or 2,700? Councilmember Plowman. I'm sorry. Councilmember Ellinger has I'm a question. Uh, can you restate, is, did you say up to 2,700? And I guess I'll ask you and then ask um, also planning. When we set a number, um, I think they, I want to make sure that what we do is what they want us to do. But how did you say, did you say 2,700 or up to 2,700? Will you will shall you amend? Shall amend. Just repeat the whole sure. amendment, please. Okay. My amendment would be shall identify 2,700 acres for inclusion within the urban service area. Is that what your request was? Yes, thank you. Okay. And then um, planning you. director. Does that does that fall? Because I know you were, when we were starting to talk about numbers, that becomes an issue, and we had said. To, uh, no, no less than 27 up to 5,000. Does, does hers say in 27? Does that come? Was that work? That's more specific, Councilmember Ellinger, than we would recommend. We would prefer a range, uh, like is offered right now, between 2,700 and 5,000. Uh, something, as you recommended, up to 2,700 would be the range, rather than just a specific number. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Wu. Thank you, Mayor. Um, that is, uh, I share Councilmember Ellinger's concern about that because that is something we ran into with the original proposal of 5,000 acres when it just said 5,000 and it's a very specific exact number and I think that would be a difficult to achieve. Um, so I would like to move to amend uh, Councilmember Plowman's uh, amendment to read up to 2,700 acres. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Ellinger seconds. Now, we have two people on to discuss the previous amendment, but we're going to do a hand if you want to discuss the current amendment, which says up to 2,700 acres. If you want to discuss this, please raise your hand. Okay, we'll start with Councilmember Gray, then Councilmember Reynolds, then Councilmember Worley. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to say on last or June 1st, when we made our decision, we were very clear in our stance, 2,700 to 5,000. Um, we had 10 members of our council who did agree to that. And to decrease, to say up to 2,700, I would need to just have a, a rationale for that. Are you asking? I'm asking. Do you have a rationale, Vice Mayor? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the criticisms of the original 5,000 acre um, proposal was that it was arbitrary. It's a, it is a number kind of drawn out of thin air. Uh, 2,700 uh, came about um, uh, first from Councilmember Savigny's um, suggestion because it is 10% of the potential expandable land uh, out there. Um, honestly, any number that we throw out there is going to be somewhat arbitrary. Um, and I think to Councilmember Plowman's point, um, we're trying to come up with a compromise position that whatever this expansion does, that it doesn't have more far-reaching, uh, larger impacts that it would with a larger amount of acreage. So I'm not wedded to this number. I'm not sure if Councilmember Plowman is, but to me it's a compromise position. Um, thank you. Okay. Did, did you have anything else? Okay. Council Member Reynolds and then Council Member Worley. Thank you, Mayor. I guess my question, I don't know if it's for law or planning. Um, so if we say up to 2,700, could that mean nothing or 1,000? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's what I needed to know. Thank you. I love short answers. Councilmember Worley. Thank you, Mayor. And 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 that's price, precisely why I'd ask my colleagues to uh, to not support this motion. It defeats the purpose of the whole conversation we're having. Um, Twenty seven hundred in itself may not be enough acreage. Certainly less than that. Uh, would almost certainly not be enough acreage. And that's why through previous compromise, 
we backed off from my original proposal of a hard 5,000 acres to a range that would be determined by the Planning Commission so that this council states a policy directive that we need more land for housing and for jobs, and then we let the experts do that. This is doing exactly what we were advised not to do and getting back in and being too specific and keeping our hands on it too closely. And when you say, where did the original 5,000 acres come from, that it seems arbitrary, and Vice Mayor, you're right, most any number we come up will have some level of arbitrariness to it, but it came as a suggestion from Lexington for Everyone, who is made up of stakeholders that are involved in the jobs, homes, and cultural and faith leading of our community. So Commerce Lexington, the Building Industry Association, the Black Faith Leaders, the Bluegrass Realtors, people who are studying this and watching this every day, it was 5,000 was their suggestion. And that's why I used the 5,000 number. Then through conversations with you all, through compromise up at this horseshoe, through listening to the advice of our law department, we said let's do 2,700 to 5,000 because that was a range that we all thought might work. And let's let the Planning Commission decide. And the Planning Commission may well say 2,700 is all we need. But if we limit them to that, we may well have had all this debate for little success. We have to build more housing and we have to make more for jobs. And we can go on and on and on about what is affordable and what's not affordable. All housing will lead to, more housing will lead to all housing being more affordable at all levels. Supply and demand is a real thing. <clears throat> and more housing, more opportunities gives our administration the Planning Commission, our planning staff, and ultimately this council, more tools, more opportunities to be creative, come up with new ways to build, new ways to incentivize. An expansion and a master plan is a tool. So it, we are cutting ourselves off here if we accept this. And I would ask you all not, not to follow that along. We have to see the writing on the wall. People cannot afford to live in our community. And those who will not see it, I tell you, there are none so blind as those who will not see. We have got to see, and we've got to do something to help. We are now limiting ourselves after months and months of debate. We are limiting ourselves here. Please do not support this amendment. Does anyone else wish to speak to Vice Mayor's amendment with the words up to 2,700 acres? Councilmember Legree. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor, for um, this amendment and Councilmember Plowman uh, for bringing this forward. I know that, as you insinuated, um, that was a pragmatic suggestion on your behalf. Um, as you'll recall from my June 1st vote, um, the statement about which I will not rehash here, um, I, though I remain against the underlying expansion, um, I want you to know that I will vote uh, in support of this motion. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to the motion to amend the amendment? Councilmember James Brown. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, Councilmember Plowman, I, I do appreciate and know where the spirit of your motion is coming from. Um, and I guess we can talk about that when we get, if we get back to it. Um, but I won't support uh, the amendment from Vice Mayor Wu. I just think saying up to uh, uh, does put us in a position where we, we're not giving our planning commission enough uh, uh, acreage to consider in regards to addressing the issues that we've identified. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? All right. We'll take the vote on the motion to amend the amendment to say up to 2,700 acres. All those in favor say aye. aye. Is anyone opposed? No. That motion fails. All right. The amendment on the floor by Councilmember Plowman is to put in the number 2,700 acres for expansion. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Worley. Thank you, Mayor. And I, Councilmember, th I'm glad that you're here back with us tonight. And I understand the nature of, of this particular motion. And 
I think there are always compromises that can be made. I think we've already made a compromise to leave this to the Planning Commission. I think we need to give them a range. Uh, and to me, just a hard 2700 doesn't provide us, I think, what we need. I think there needs to be a range and it needs to be the Planning Commission's decision. So I'd be interested to hear what my colleagues feel about uh, about any sort of compromise language here. I think we've already made that compromise and I think our planning staff and our legal department are comfortable with that. Um, so I, I, I'm not supportive of the motion, um, though I'd understand in principle where, where you're coming from, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member Savigny. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I, I appreciate the fact um, that you are with us tonight as well, Council Member Plumman. And, um, and we also have another Council Member who's with us tonight, so, and I appreciate you being here, Council Member Lynch. Um, so you can enjoy the fun <laughs> that we've been having. Um, I would like to, I would, uh, and I get where this is going, and I, I think that um, there's several of us who do not feel comfortable with the the upper limit. Um, when I originally agree, when I originally put the lower limit on this, um, my intent was to to try to give a big enough range for the um, planning commission to work with. Um, I would be very comfortable with with tightening that limit. Um, and I would, I would probably, I'm going to make a motion to, um, to just change the, uh, but no more than 3,000 acres, um, between 2,700 acres and 3,000 acres. So, so your so motion, moved. okay. So there's a motion to insert language of 2,700 to 3,000. 3, 3,000, and it's acres. mostly because I know that a range is needed, mm -hmm. and. I think it, it deals with the concept of um, under, this council understanding that the process actually is important, and, um, and I, th I think we do realize that it's important. Um, I do think that by limiting the amount, um, we can provide for maybe a better solution for everybody um, and a decent compromise on this um, piece of legislation. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right, Council Member Ellinger seconds. So that is changing the language to include the range of 2,700 to 3,000 acres. Please log in if you wish to speak to this amendment. Council Member Gray. Thank you, Mayor. Um, once again, I'm about to be a broken record. On June 1st, we, the council, made a decision. We had an opportunity to say 3,000. We had an opportunity to say um, 2,700. We voted and we agreed. 10 members of the council said 2,700 to 5,000. I don't understand the de decrease in the number. Um, I would need to colleague, I would need to have an actual concrete expressly stated reason and rationale for why we would be decreasing that number. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Councilmember Baxter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will not be supporting this amendment because I do not feel like three, a 300 acre swing is enough um, leeway for our planning commission to do anything with so i will be standing firm in uh, my original vote for the 2700 to 5000 acre range that we have given them um, furthermore i really hope we can just we can just stop this conversation with the with the compromise seriously we've hashed it out we've talked about it i understand why everybody is still working towards it um, but we're not getting anywhere. And um, we've done the work, and let's move along. I will not be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fred Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I won't support the amendment either. Uh, we sat in several hours deliberation two weeks ago and decided that we would 
be the, it would be the best for the community and the best for everybody to that we give the range to the to the planning commission i really didn't agree with the planning commission having that much authority or that much power but that's what the compromise was so the compromise was that 2700 to 5000 would take care of that unfortunately we've still got a crowd of people that don't want to compromise for any acreage and I understand that where they're coming from but I don't agree with it because a compromise usually allows for a lot of things that we can do going forward so uh, I, I just think that the, my colleagues who have brought this up these amendments up if you look at their voting record they were the ones that voted against it when we went 10-3. So it's kind of a delay tactic to me and I think we just need to <laughs> we need to go forward and and uh, let's make our votes known and um, uh, move this community forward in the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Wu. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I share my colleagues' frustration with the fact that we've been at this seemingly for a long, long time. Uh, and I've probably expressed in the past um, my own personality, especially coming from a small business point of view, I'm a very impatient person. I'm a very action-oriented person. Um, I don't like to talk things to death, but I do think this issue that we're tackling right now is the most important issue of not just this year, but years and decades to come, and I do want to be very deliberative about it. Um, as Councilmember Plowman said, we're in a place of very um, realistic uh, political situation in that um, those of us who uh, oppose the current expansion uh, as it's stated um, don't have the votes to overturn it so what we are trying to do again which is what I've been talking about is build in safeguards guardrails and mitigate whatever um, lasting effects that it may have um, I honestly don't know and I don't want to speak for the people in the audience my feeling at this point, I don't think where we are where we are 27 years ago uh, in that folks are uh, adamantly opposed to any expansion of any size. I think what I heard um, from public comment was folks were opposing the expansion um, without a, a real true process, which was what I was trying to push for and go for. Um, so I will be voting for this amendment, but more importantly, I will be voting for uh, Council Member Plowman's uh, amendment to uh, limit the size of the, uh, the overall uh, expansion area. And I want to go home too. I absolutely <laughs> do. Um, but I, I think we need, to, um, we need to figure this out, and I think this is very necessary, what we're doing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Sheehan. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Plowman, I, I want to say um, I support your efforts to make an amendment tonight. I understand that you could not be here when we had the original discussion due to, your, due to health concerns, and I think you should be allowed to take rest um, when you need it and then come back and join the discussion when you were able because I think it is your right um, and your responsibility to represent your district and you've heard from a lot of them today and I know we've been receiving a lot of emails on both sides of this issue but um, I do understand um, what you're wanting to do with this expansion um, limiting the size of it I am going to support the amendment and support the underlying um, motion because I think this is a compromise point we, we can hear from the community that they, um, there is some disagreement over this. So I think this allows a limited expansion up to 3,000 acres um, with a master plan. And then anything beyond that would return to the goal four process that would be underway. So I, again, I'm gonna support this because it allows for expansion, um, but then also, was, which is what we hear from some community members that they want, but it will also allow us to return some of that to the goal for process, which I have been a vocal supporter for since the beginning. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Plowman. 
Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council Members. Thank you, Council Member Sheehan. Um, <clears throat> I guess I wasn't following the, the compromise part of the, another statement because in my mind, if 5,000's out there backing it up, kind of, you know, half and half, well, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,700. Um, I guess I come back and I gravitate to, again, the point I made, all that acreage out there, and in the next couple years, we're not going to be able to absorb that. So why put that out there? Let's come down to a, to a, a level that's, that's reasonable. Um, and I think, too, the perception of the public. Um, I think that when you say, up to 5,000, that's what they, they walk away with. They walk away, oh gosh, 5,000, well that's, what did we say before, five, five times the size of the airport? Um, I think with time and with history, you're gonna see that what we're putting out there right now, 2,700, or if, if it goes to the 3,000, is reasonable. It is reasonable, and history tells us that, but also, and no pun intended, the lay of the land tells us that. So I, 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 I do, um, again, um, stand behind what I have put out there. I think, for our, I think for our community, being able to say to our community, we represent, we recognize where you're coming from, we recognize where you're coming from, let's come together. I mean, that's what we're about, and that is the greater good. Is it perfect always for each side? No. But isn't that our role, is to take kind of a look and just say, okay, we can't win them all, but we can come closer together and let's do it together. Um, so that's why I've put that out there. That's why I consider your consideration of that. And um, that's it, enough said. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Worley. Thank you, Mayor. I think what you have to keep in mind is, and we all have been at this a long time, and um, but not even all of us sitting here, we've been at it for 27 years. For 27 years, we've not expanded the urban services boundary. And at that time, there were 11,000 acres alleged to be available with inside the boundary. Nowadays, regardless of how you argue it, the highest number that's been offered by reasonable studies is 5,300 acres. And we know that the actual availability of that is more like 2,000 or 2,000 or give or take. When you look at a, an expansion and, an, and when you think about a master plan and when you think about the comp plan, you are planning for the future. We cannot wait until we are completely choked out before we decide that it is time. We have to start planning for the future now. We know that we're not even going to have an idea of what this acreage is and what it might look like for at least 18 months. We've directed that of our, of our planning commission. I would encourage those that think that five is too much to be interested and work with the Planning Commission, make your voice heard. But, and it may be too much, they may decide they don't need it, but they need a lot of land to make this happen and they need to put it in reasonable places. We just, you know, we, we talk and talk and talk and we, we let this conversation get emotional about horse versus people, to be honest. It's the, the urban services boundary is not solely about preserving horse farms, and I am for that. Let me tell you about the day, at la last Thursday, when we finished, the next morning, Friday morning, I represented a client buying a horse farm who wants to be a farmer. I represent racetrack owners and horse owners, but I also spent 13 years in the affordable housing world representing affordable ho uh, housing developers and lenders. I get all the sides of this. We are now talking about something of one last thing to knock back just a little so that we, I don't know, appease? <clears throat> we know what we need to do here. We need to give our planning commission and our planning staff every possible tool that they have so that we can make a difference in our community. And we need to start thinking about displaced low and middle income residents, particularly those in uh, minority and uh, downtown neighborhoods. We need to think about, we, we heard from our poet laureate that Lexington has always been a sanctuary for people in the LGBT community to come from other communities where they didn't feel so welcome. What if those people can't afford to live here? We hear about our great farms and they are great and they do provide jobs. We heard that tonight, they provide great jobs. But what about several of our immigrant community, uh, some in our immigrant community? They get some of those great jobs, but then can't afford to live in, our, in Lexington and can't find safe places to live. What about mothers and fathers who have raised their children here and then have to watch them go live in other communities 
because they can't afford to live here or they can't find a job here? What about all these great students that we attract here and we want to, we want to be a part of our community? And then they can't stay because they can't afford it or they can't get the job that they want. At this point, we are literally trying to go X and O, X and O over some sort of appeasement. We know what we need to do and we've been advised to empower our planning commission to do it. Let's not choke that off now. Council Member Gray, are you on again to speak? Council Member Savigny, do you want to go ahead first? Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I think Council Member Gray had asked me a question specifically, and uh, I just picked a 10% range. So uh, it, just mathematical, uh, just mathematical 2,700 to um, 3,000. And then I just wanted to add one other thing is that um, um, this council has agreed that um, goal four and the process is actually important. Um, they're just putting this little piece, this little piece in front of the process, okay? So the process is still going on. The process is still going to happen. And to be quite frank, I, like I'm quite sure that when our planning commission is doing a their their big plan for a geography it's going to be it's going to include more area than 3000 acres it's going they'll probably have some several several different scenarios um, and then when we start using the actual process that actually brings in land that people want to actually sell and want to actually do something with um, the process will actually work the way it, the process is supposed to work um, and and will engage people that want to sell. So I think all we're trying to do um, is limit the amount um, that is not being used. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna be um, used circumventing the process. That's it, that's all we're trying to do. And I, I appreciate your yes vote on this. Thank you, Council Member Gray. Well, I would appreciate your no vote to this. <laughs> um, um, it was mentioned earlier that this is a political issue. It may be a political issue. By the way, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> it may be a political issue for those of you who think it's political. However, for me, this is a community of all people issue. It's about ensuring people of my district who are not represented here, because the people of my district, the sixth district, are busy working two jobs to ensure that they can afford their home here in Lexington. I know that you can't relate. I know you can't relate. But there are people in Lexington who really want to live here. who really want to make Lexington their home, but they can't. Decrease it, you say. Who is that helping in the future? Is it helping actual residents of Lexington? Is it helping our next generation who are growing up, who want to make Lexington their home? I don't want another generation of Lexingtonians who want to live in their hometown, who want to afford home in their hometown, who don't just want to be the help, as some of the emails said they were okay with the people being the help and making an outside county their home. If you work in Lexington and you want to live here, we should do everything in our, in our abilities as lawmakers who represent all Lexingtonians. This is not a political issue at all. It's about ensuring that all Lexingtonians can afford to live here, that we have the acreage here in Lexington for them to make Lexington their home. This is not about the present. This is about the future of Lexington. 
and I'm passionate about making sure Lexington is a place for all people and not the most wealthy, not just the farm owners. We want the horse farms to be here. There is no way that any of us want to make, to do away with what brings Lexington our funds. This is about humanity. And I'm passionate about every single resident of Lexington. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. No one else has signed up to speak, so we'll go ahead and take the vote on Councilmember Savigny's motion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? No. All right, that motion failed. And so now we'll go to Councilmember Plowman's amendment, which is still on the floor um, and has not been amended. Uh, does anyone wish to speak to it? Hers is the amendment that states 2,700 acres for expansion. Does anyone wish to speak to it? Councilmember James Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and I'll be brief. And Councilmember Plowman, I agree and, and share the same sentiments that Councilmember Sheehan shared about you not being here and you, uh, June the 1st, but being here today and bringing this amendment forward. Um, I think a big part of it is, is um, what it may do is address some of the fears that a lot of folks think that we're just being, uh, this council is not being um, considerate of the urban service boundary and what it has provided for our community. And I don't think that's the case, but I think your amendment will probably, or has the intent to, 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 to share that with folks. My concern, and I want to support it, but my concern is uh, is being is us being too restrictive on the planning commission. Uh, I think when they um, expanded the boundary in '96, you know there are partial uh, lots that are in and are out, and I think they were probably trying to, and I don't know, stick to a number, try to do the best that they could with the information they had. But I think that has created some challenges for us uh, today. And I think giving the Planning Commission a range uh, will give them the opportunity to be more flexible and more diligent with crafting the new uh, line in the expansion area. So I appreciate the sentiment of your motion, but I, I do think it would be beneficial to give the Planning Commission um, a range to work from as opposed to a set number. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment on the floor? I see no one. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Is anyone opposed? No. Okay. Uh, that motion fails uh, six to seven. All right. So we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Wu. I'll take us back to the beginning, <laughs> which has been amended by Vi by. Councilmember Gray's uh, motion uh, in the beginning that passed regarding low and middle income and affordable housing. Is there anything else about the motion to approve the goals and objectives as it's amended? Anyone wish to speak? Councilmember Reynolds. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I haven't made a statement about my stance on this publicly, though I've spoken with many people and tried to write back my constituents that wrote me, though I'm, I might have missed one here or there. Um, so I just wanted to uh, speak uh, a little bit about um, my opinion uh, and, real, and hope that everyone realizes that each of us um, have struggled with this and have worked a long time on this issue. Um, and as many of my um, colleagues have said, none of us want to eat up our precious farmland, and we're not talking about um, taking away big farms. Um, those are protected, many of them, and that will not change. Um, and my, my idea about the urban service boundary has evolved a lot since I uh, first got on council. Um, as I've seen so many struggle to find an affordable place to live. I've also seen uh, most people who I talk with say that they want to maintain the boundary, um, but in reality be against 
almost all development inside the boundary. I have been yelled at, and I quote, the city hates us. And that is because of the comprehensive plan. When they are referring to uh, being in opposition of density. Our constituents are saying one thing, but in practicality are wanting another thing. In order to infill this, um, this we have to do development everywhere. And a lot of drastic things have to happen. We have to build up really high. We have to have huge apartment complexes. We have to open dead end roads. We have to have affordable housing in our backyard. We have to have zone changes and all kinds of zone um, amendments that favor infill. And uh, this includes having businesses um, in our neighborhood. Right now, all of those things are being opposed at every turn, and there's a lot of pressure on council members to represent the constituents' desires not to develop at all near their neighborhood or their house. And that means that I am in a really hard position. Defend and fill and redevelopment because we have a boundary and goals and objectives, or represent the interests of the people who elected me. I try to do both, but it doesn't always work. Another senior housing tower is literally being built in my own backyard. Uh, and while many of my neighbors have a strong issue with it, it doesn't bother me because I know that that housing is needed. We cannot keep a boundary and build the more housing that we desperately need and at the exact same time make infill impossible. We cannot do that. We will never reach a decision that makes everyone happy and we only, only a compromise um, is possible and that means that none of us, myself included, are going to be content with all the details. I don't wanna get rid of our farmlands without a plan and as has been stated this evening, we have a plan and we're working on a plan. We're working on both at the same time. This issue is not all one-sided. It is not just about the horse farms and greedy developers. This issue has been messaged every which way, and there's a lot of parts of this issue that have not been messaged and have not been messaged properly. I'm not being swayed by one side or the other. I have gone to many farms, and I have also looked at the boundary and seen um, where developers want to develop. We are looking for ways to ensure more affordable housing in this plan and beyond, and I'm interested in making sure we can help developers build more housing, and especially affordable housing. We need to do a better job of that, and I've seen how it's done in other communities, and I'm ready to move forward, and. Um, and help make improvements. That being said, um, we have to make a decision now and we are going to entrust our planning staff and the planning commission to help us move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Baxter. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, I wanted to say that I am really proud of the work that we have done. We've gone through a deliberative and thoughtful process and I'm really, really proud of our work. I believe that we all want what's best for our community, but there's a lot of opinions on what that means. But I am confident that we have built a firm foundation for community growth in these goals and objectives, and that we have placed our trust in a highly competent and professional planning department and planning commission. We have set the guardrails for how this land and how our community will grow and how this land will be used, and I'm really excited for our future. As Councilmember Reynolds said, and I will echo, I am tired of sitting through zone change after zone change to deliberate, to deliberate infill projects that are continually opposed by neighboring communities. And I think this work will put us on the right path. Like Councilmember Reynolds said, we can't have it both ways. We can't maintain our boundary and, con and, and disagree with every infill project that is proposed. It's just not possible. 
I truly believe that the work that we have completed is the best for our community, and I am, it has been my pleasure and honor to work with all of my colleagues on this, and I really appreciate all of the community input as well. Um, it has been a long process, and I have lost a lot of sleep over what is best for our community, and I really, really, truly feel Sorry, I'm getting choked up because I'm so passionate. I want everybody to know that we all have thought about this so much and we are trying so hard to do what is best for our community. And I really truly feel like this work is that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lynch. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, first, I was just like to um, Thank my colleagues for the work that you put in on June 1st, and I apologize that I couldn't be here, but I was watching you every single minute and rooting you on. Um, so I appreciate all of the opinions, the research, the feedback that was shared and the discussions that you all had that day. Um, I want to thank everyone that has either called my office phone or sent an email. I'm an advocate by nature that's in my DNA, so I appreciate your advocacy quite a bit. I, I'm thankful for everyone that spoke up here tonight, um, sharing your issues, your concerns, your opinions. Um, I take that all into consideration in my decision. Um, I also take into consideration my over 15 years doing landlord-tenant um, work in the state of Kentucky, and specifically in this county. Um, I've seen, <laughs> held the hand of many, many uh, renters um, through eviction, um, through having their belongings on the street and not having any place to go with their kids the next day because they can't afford another place to live. Um, I've worked with unhoused folks for over 15 years, seeing the struggles, stood by them, um, cried tears along with them. So I know how, it, how much of a struggle it is to live in Lexington um, and be pre precariously housed. I, I'm quite familiar with that, familiar with that story. Um, I can even share my own story. Um, when I was a renter here in um, Lexington and my lease was ending um, within 60 days and I had to give my landlord notice whether I was gonna stay or um, leave and I had been feverishly working with a great um, real estate agent to find a place I could afford to live here. And literally, literally by the grace of God, I was able to find a house that I could afford um, 30 days before I had to be out, of my, be out of my townhouse that I was renting. I, I didn't know where I was going. I stepped out on faith that day. So I know how hard it is to find housing in this city because I've done that. I've been a renter here and I'm, I'm blessed to be a homeowner here. And I know the struggle quite well. And I don't want others to have to go through that like I, had to, like I had to, and if there's anything I can do to prevent that, I'm going to do that. Um, my neighbors in the second district elected me here, and I'm very humbly and blessed they did that, so that I can um, support policies with their um, futures in mind, and our entire city's positive future in mind. And I've said in a prior meetings that we have to set ourselves up for a bright future. We're making decisions today that I want to be impactful positively in the future. We're not just legislating in the now, but we're legislating for the future with the future in mind. So I support the amended um, goals and objectives that my colleagues, um, through much discussion on June 1st and prior, that we did prior, um, um, that they have put forth, I think that we need to give um, our planning commission, our planning division, um, lots of area and room to make sure that we are um, setting our city up for the brightest future that can possibly happen. Um, and if we can do anything, if I can do anything to prevent um, my neighbors from being precariously housed or not knowing where they're gonna go the next day um, or that they can't afford a, a place to live and they're gonna have to look for opportunities in other cities. I wanna make sure that we, make, we make that right decision today to support um, opportunity. Um, this vote is to support choice. Everyone should have choices. And um, if we make a decision to remove choice, what kind of city are we? We wanna be able to give all of our neighbors, not just a few, but all of our neighbors the choice to live here um, 
with their family and to set roots here. Um, so I thank you, to thank my colleagues. Um, Vice Mayor, I wanna thank you specifically. You led a dynamic process for us to do a deep dive into these goals and objectives. Um, I think I thought it was very, very well done. And I appreciate the, the, the intricate way that we were able to give input and discussion here. Um, so thank you to my colleagues again, and I look forward to supporting the amended goals and objectives. Council Member Fred Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm not sure where to start because I've been around so long. Uh, I'll start back maybe in the 70s uh, with emerged government. And I'm proud of Lexington from that coming forward because we really had a plan back then of putting this community on one track and that was to make it the best community that we could. And I think we've done that. Um, uh, I know I've served on the council several years and have seen a lot of zone changes and a lot of uh, bantering back and forth on what's good for the community and what's not good for the community. I'll, uh, I'll start with maybe 1996 uh, when uh, the urban service boundary was expanded. I happened to be on the council at that time and we deliberated and we went through process and uh, really felt like that we had needed economic growth and we needed to uh, take care of our citizens out there. Uh, we actually at that time built a boundary, I call it a fence, around Lexington, which says we've got a boundary here so everybody just stay out unless you can afford to come inside and, and buy a house that's for sale. Uh, I don't know of very many communities that have actually circled the wagons like Lexington has. Um, and we still are doing that. Uh, 27 years later, uh, we're, not, we don't, we're not given the opportunity. We need land for economic uh, development more than anything. Um, affordable housing, I'm not sure. I, I keep trying to define that and it goes, it, it's ahead of me. Uh, uh, affordable housing is what you make of it. What it is today won't be what it is in five years or 10 years. Uh, the, I, disagree, I disagree that, the, that this city, and, and we've had that, uh, uh, you know, people have talked about this council and even prior, prior councils that I've been on, that we did not have a plan for growth. <clears throat> I tell you, everything that I've got been involved in, we've definitely had a plan for growth. We, we got a, a planning department and we got a planning commission that is uh, probably rates up there with anybody in the state uh, or maybe nationwide. Uh, but we've fallen short on that plan, but it's not because we haven't tried. Uh, we tried the infield development plan was part of this thing that came in uh, several years ago. Guess what? The neighborhoods come here and say, no, we don't want to infill around our area, not in our backyard. So, you know, we've tried that part of the plan and it hasn't worked effectively. Uh, one of the other things that I'm real proud of, in 1999, we said, we've got valuable property here. We've got a unique community. Let's see if we can set aside some property. And we called it purchase development rights. I mean, we went through a lot of deliberation on that to get it started. That's the greatest thing that we've done for this community. And we've already saved 33,000 acres and are on our way to 50,000 acres. So it's not like we're uh, building out here and, and trying to expand just for the, the sake of development or just for the sake to have more land. Uh, you know, the 2018 uh, comp plan, had provisions in it, and that was, you know, had a plan in there, but the planning department, you know, they didn't act timely on it, so we had to come forward in this 2023 and bring forth that 2018 and say, and, and, and uh, we, we got it into committee, go for committee to look at it, and but nothing has been done. So there's a, another five years that we really have not made any progress. I venture to say even with this, addition of land. Uh, it'll be another five to ten years before part of that will be developed. And I go back to the 1996 that, uh, uh, expansion that we had. If I'm not correct, uh, I don't know the numbers, but probably half of that 
hundred acres has been developed. So, you know, you put the acreage out there, that doesn't mean it's going to get developed, but you've got to have a plan for the future. So I view this expansion, I'm going to support it. I view it as a pr protective uh, a land option that we have, and I'm, I'm going to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Wu. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to make a quick point of clarification for everybody in the room. Uh, the thing we're about to vote on, we are not voting to approve the goals and objectives. We are currently voting to place the goals and objectives on the docket for the council meeting that is to follow this meeting for first reading. And then on Thursday at our council meeting, we will have second reading and the final vote on it. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear on that point. Um, to something that Council Member Reynolds talked about, um, she mentioned that we would be working on expansion and the process at the same time. And if that were true, I would be pretty happy and it, a lot of my reservations would be removed um, from our conversations on June 1. What we did is we, we placed one thing before the other. We placed expansion first, put a December 2024 deadline on it, and we put a process second and put a, I believe it was fall of 26, so three years down the road. That's been my concern this entire time. It was not about whether or not we were going to expand. It wasn't about where we were going to expand. It wasn't about how much we were going to expand. It was about how do we do it? What is the process? How do we build that process for the long term? One of my frustrations as a new council member walking in in 2023 is catching up to everything that happened before us and finding out about the comp plan in 2018 and what was done and not done and kind of what gets put in our laps and wondering, wait, what happened here? Why wasn't this voted on? Why, why isn't this already existing? And so my biggest fear, and I've stated this before, is not about how much land we expand into, where do we expand, how big is the expansion. My, my fear has always been that this process will never get finished and that the council of 2028 will look back on us when they tackle the comp plan and say, what was the council of 2023 doing? And why isn't this done yet? And why are we still having the same conversation that we've had for over a generation? I wanna put process first. This current goals and objectives is not perfect. I think everyone knows my objections to uh, the expansion proposal within it. But I'll say this, we all want the best. I think Council Member Baxter and I think everyone has expressed that. Um, I really have enjoyed working with this council and really working through this process, even though it's been a, a long, sometimes bruising slog. And I wanna say, as a new council member, along with my new colleagues who have just gotten here, and honestly, along with the majority of this council who has not gone through comp plan, right? Most of us were not here five years ago. Um, I really, really do appreciate the, wor the way that we have worked through this um, without it ever getting personal, without it ever getting mean, um, that we are debating the issues. We have sometimes vast differences on how we think the city should grow, but I think we all want what's best for the, um, for the city. So when it comes down to it on Thursday, if nothing else changes um, with reservations about the expansion plan, I will be uh, voting uh, to approve the goals and objectives as well. Uh, who knows what'll happen in two days. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. It's a long time, two days. <laughs> Council Member Legree. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mayor. I, I was just deciding if I was going to weigh in at this point, and um, I've decided I will. Um, you know, the, the motion in front of you is about um, moving our goals and objectives that we've worked on for quite some time onto the docket. And I want to say that I think that there are many outstanding um, aspects of our goals and objectives, and I want to share my appreciation for the intelligence and hard work of our planning staff and our, our um, planning commission, um, because I know that you've been working with us and with each other for a long, long time on this. Um, and I've, I really am supportive of, of many, many aspects of, of this plan. 
Um, however, my position is still at no when it comes to short-term expans expansion, and I feel comfortable in maintaining that position. I really do believe, um, Vice Mayor, you were just talking about this, in our long-range planning process and in the necessity of that process. We're going to get to where we need to be using the tools of long-range planning. Um, but I am concerned, and, and you all, I'm reiterating something I shared previously, that this um, expansion plan in uh, goal three will open up rural land for development and, re and in turn require new city services, infrastructure, and utilities um, in that process. And I'm honestly not in favor of the ramifications of that decision because I, even though I appreciate everything that we have added today, and I'm in support of affordable housing, and I and I added the amendment about um, middle and low income, and I'm 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 proud that those things made it through. I still have concerns that the true costs will out, outweigh the desired benefits. Um, and again, this is my position as arguably the, the council member with arguably the most dense district, um, one who will feel many of the pressures and opportunities associated with infill. And as someone who feels very strongly about climate change and environmental concerns, um, and those are concerns that are shared by my constituents. And I know and I respect that everybody has thought about this really hard, um, but I remain concerned that rather than devoting resources to make our current neighborhoods more equitable, these new tracks will again permanently change our landscape, that they'll create sprawl, that they'll create pollution um, with only the hope that they can actually address our, our current and future needs. Um, and I say this as someone who cares about intentional city planning and who cares about a more walkable, dense, and more accessible city, accessible for many, many people. Um, and I believe that many of these goals and objectives get us closer to that vision. So colleagues, I know that you know where I stand on this expansion in goal three. And I hope that I've articulated my process and values in getting to this point in my decision-making process. And I trust that you respect that, um, even though we're at very different places, some of us. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Sheehan. Thank you, Mayor. I know a lot of our discussion tonight has been particular to goal three on theme E and our goals and objectives. I want to encourage the public and everyone here today, anyone who is watching these meetings, um, to look at the entirety of this document because just like our budget is a reflection of our, our values, um, these goals and objectives indicate our values from this council and from the community as well. Theme E is all about housing and building successful neighborhoods, including infill and redevelopment and expanding housing choices, um, addressing community facilities. Goal um, theme B is all about protecting the environment. And there are a lot of metrics and, and good work and policy recommendations that have been put into that. Theme C is all about creating jobs and prosperity. Um, which we know is important for so many in our community and, and our economic development and success here in Lexington. Theme D is about per improving a desirable community. So um, it's about our transportation systems and complete streets. It's about um, focusing on the health and safety and quality of life needs of residents in our community um, and protecting um, our arts and culture. Theme E, we've had a lot of talk about it is all around our land use policies, but then importantly at the end is theme F. This is about how we engage and educate residents of our county in the planning process um, and how we work to, in, to implement all of the goals and objectives in our comprehensive plan um, that we have outlined, including regional planning. So there is very important work here outside of just our land use, um, although of course that is important to our community. So I encourage everyone to get involved in the, in the rest of the comprehensive plan and discussions as the policy recommendations come forward for the rest of this plan. 
I also want to say a sincere thank you, of course, to everyone from the community has, who has engaged on this issue, but I see a number of our planning commission members here um, in this room, and I want to thank you all for the work that you did to bring this to us and the continued work that you will do to turn this six-page document into about a 600-page document. Um, so thank you for that in advance and for the work that you have done. Um, and I want to sincerely thank our planning staff because I know you have worked with not only our planning commission, who are volunteers, by the way, our planning commission, just to say that, they do a lot of, lot of time and work volunteering, um, but to our planning staff who have worked with us. I know you have helped me craft language for the amendments that I wanted to make for the goals and objectives, and you have been working with, all, with other council members and our planning commission and our community as this has moved forward. So I thank you for the engagement and the education that you have done for us, um, but also for the community as a whole. So um, if any of my district residents want to ask me questions about my positions on any of this, um, or have questions about the comprehensive plan as a whole, I encourage you to reach out to me. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So the motion on the floor is to place on the docket for the June 13th, 2023 meeting of the Urban County Council a resolution adopting goals and objectives for the Imagine Lexington 2045 comprehensive plan as amended. Please say aye. aye. Is anyone opposed? We only have eight votes, 10. Has everyone voted? I think we need Okay. All right. Thank you. That motion passes. Now, let's move on.